I love cooking out on my Kamado, but what I don't like is the lack of prep space my current setup provides. Today, I have a plan that should corner the market on space efficiency while still allowing me to fully enjoy my patio. So let's get started on Timber Biscuit. So as I hinted at in the opening, the plan for today is to build a grill station for my Kamado grill. Now this grill station could be used for any style of Kamado as long as it falls into the large slash extra large size range. While you could probably get away with a medium size, this grill station might be a little big for that. So the first thing I need to do with this project is break down my lumber, which is what you see me doing here. Now I'm going to be using two different species for this piece, Sapili and Eucalyptus, which will give me some fun contrast in the design. And speaking of the design, why don't we go ahead and take a look at that now. So as my corner pun at the start indicated, this grill station is designed to sit at the corner of a patio. This allowed me to add two wings to the design without taking up as much real estate as it would if it was just a large table. So the theme with this piece is big sweeping curves and really beefy joinery. So all the joinery on this piece is going to be more to some tenon to give us that added strength we need to hold up the Kamado. It also features slats on the top and lower shelf to make sure there's plenty of space for water to run off and not settle on the tops. Alright, so now that we have some of those design goals laid out, let's get to work on actually building this piece. So once I had all my pieces cut down to their rough length, I could go ahead and take them over to the joiner so that I could cut them down to their rough width. And I'm starting here at the joiner so that I can have a nice clean edge to run against my bandsaw fence. Since a lot of these boards are roughly twice the width that I need them to be, I'm going to rip them down at the bandsaw so that I can preserve as much material as possible. I really love using a bandsaw to rip down rough lumber like this, but if you don't have a bandsaw, the next best option would be to mill this down completely flat and then rip it down over at the table saw. What you definitely don't want to do is rip rough lumber at the table saw because it could twist and pinch the blade which could cause kickback and you definitely don't want to deal with all that. So the next step was to run all 69 board foot of Sapili over the joiner to flatten one face. Now in past projects I've always said if you can purchase S2S lumber you should do so because it saves you a lot of time. And in this case unfortunately I couldn't get S2S lumber for the Sapili. So since this is rough cut lumber I'm going to have to flatten each board individually. Now because I'm going to be using mortise and tenon joinery on this entire project it's actually a lot better to start out with a perfectly flat board anyway. In a lot of other applications, it doesn't really matter if your boards are truly completely flat. I get that that's the goal for every project, but if they're off a hair one way or another, most people are never going to notice. However, when you're working with mortise and tenon joinery and each board relies on the next being perfectly true, it's a lot more important. So for this project, it was worth the extra time to go ahead and make sure every board was straight. So with about half my boards milled down to their final thickness, I could go ahead and get started on the legs. And to get to my final thickness on the legs, I'm going to have to laminate a few boards. And since there's 8 legs, that means 16 boards for a total of 8 laminations. Now you probably noticed in the design that there was long sweeping curves on the outer 4 legs. So in order to accomplish that, I need 4 of my legs to be 4 inches by 3 inches, while my remaining 4 legs will just be 3 inches by 3 inches. So once all the laminations had about 2 hours in clamps and then overnight to cure, I could go ahead and scrape off the excess glue and then run those boards over the joiner. Now I probably should have mentioned that at this point these boards are about a quarter inch over their final size. This way I have enough material to work my way back to my final dimension. When it comes to dimensioning all these pieces down to their final thickness, what I first like to do is head over to the table saw and then rip all the pieces down to where they're an eighth to a quarter inch over their final size. With the rail stock being so thick, I try not to aim for my final dimension at the table saw, but instead will use my planer to nail that final dimension. This is a strategy I love to use in the shop whenever I'm working with thick stocks. Now as I've shared in the past, if I was working with 3 quarter inch material then I would just leave it oversized at the table saw and plane back to it by hand later on, but using the planer almost gives me a finish ready surface without having to do all the hand work. So whenever using the planer is an option, I go for it. It's like they say, if you give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish and he'll waste hundreds of dollars on equipment he'll only use a few times a year. Next it was time to chop the legs down to their final length. So I went ahead and clamped a stop to the top of my outfeed table and chopped them down. Now I don't use my miter saw very frequently in the shop, but for 3 inch cuts like this, there's not really a better option. I'd say the only real negative about this process, for me anyway, is having to lug this thing out from underneath the outfeed table to begin with. And speaking of processes, if you guys want the plans for this project, just let me know down in the comments and as always, if there's enough interest, I'll put them together. So with all 8 legs cut down to their final length, I could go ahead and get started on the rails. And to do that, of course I'm going to use my table saw.
Now, for those of you who are wondering why I prefer my table saw over my miter saw, the answer is pretty simple. My miter saw is about one sixth of the cost of my table saw. And that's not just to say that the table saw is really expensive, that expense and cost goes into the accuracy. While my miter saw might be 95% accurate, my table saw is more in the 99% range, so I just trust it more. So with all my rails cut down to their exact final width, including the one inch tendon on either end, I could go ahead and get started on the mortise and tenon joinery. And the first thing I'll do is go ahead and lay out the orientation and then rough out all of the mortise locations on all of the legs. This way if I'm working and I'm putting a mortise where there's not a mark, I know that something's wrong. Again, these aren't the final mortise locations, but just a rough idea. From there, I'll head over to the workbench and actually lay out all the mortises. And when I say lay out all the mortises, what I really mean is lay out all the mortises on one single leg. Then from there, I'll just transfer the center line for all my mortises onto the adjoining legs. This way, I only have to lay out the mortises once, and as long as I know they're in the right location, they'll be in the right spot for all my mortises. From there, I can use my Panzer router to go ahead and plunge all those mortises to the one inch depth. Now what makes this piece really unique and tricky is that not all the mortises align in the center of the boards. On some parts they're a little closer to the edge or a little more centered than others. So I have to be really careful and pay attention to what mortise I'm cutting and where it goes. And since there's 40 mortises and 40 tenons, that's a lot to keep track of. So what I decided to do was just group all my mortises by cut height. And what I mean by that is just grouping them by how I want to cut them at the Panzer router. Because the Panzer router uses thickness to manage the height of where the bit is going to cut, all I have to do is adjust a template to half the height of whatever my mortise location is. So for any of my mortises that are a 16th of an inch higher or lower than the other set, I just use a different set of setup blocks. From there, I cut that entire group of mortises before moving on to the next one. And I know that may sound complicated, but really it's just order of operations and keeping track of things in the shop. It's just like when I mess with my son and hide stuff where he can't find it. Like when I put his shoes in the shoe cabinet, his jacket on the hanger, and his helmet on his bike. It's all about being organized. Now, if you wanted to make this project and you don't have a Panther router, which I'm going to assume is most people, you would just need to follow the same process as I did on the split top Rubo, where I used an edge guide and a router to plunge each mortise one at a time. So with all the mortises plunged, I could go ahead and move on to the tenons. Now for the majority of the tenons, they're just going to be standard tenons where they come off the board straight, and those are pretty easy and straightforward to cut. Again, if you don't have a Panzer router, you would just need to cut all these guys at the table saw. And if you want to refer to how I do that, just check out that workbench video. Where things get kind of tricky is with the mitered tenon pieces. Because I still want to use integrated tenons on the ends of my mitered pieces, I'm going to go ahead and cut them out using the Panzer router. Now these angled pieces sit at the center of the grill station and are used to adjoin our two sides. So half the cuts are going to be 45 degree miters with that extruded tenon. But there's a center stretcher that sits at about 52 degrees that's a little trickier to nail. Again, here I really needed to pay attention to the overall length, as well as the miter angles and what direction they're running on each cut. All in all, the mortise and tenon joinery for this piece took me about a day and a half, and that was really because I forced myself to slow down in the shop to avoid any mistakes. The final step was to cut the mortise into the center of those two rails for that center support, and then from there I could finally start test fitting things together and really see how we made out. Now up to this point, I obviously hadn't test fit the entire piece together and really only tested a few of the tenons into the mortises. So there were a handful that were a little snug that I cleaned up with a shoulder plane off camera. But overall, the fits were pretty nice. So the last thing to do was to go ahead and assemble both sides and connect them together. And to say there was a sigh of relief when everything came together perfectly is an understatement. This was one of those moments where taking my time really paid off because rarely am I ever this right. Just like that time my wife and I got into an argument on the elevator, I was wrong on so many levels. So now that I knew the base would eventually come together correctly, I could go ahead and get started on some of those more decorative touches. And the first thing I want to do is add a slight curve to the underside of all my rail pieces. Now normally I'd use something like a template for this process, but for all the curves on this piece, I'm just going to be using my drawing bow. What this does is it gives me an even and consistent curve from my endpoints to my center marking. And then from there, I can head over to my bandsaw and do my best to stay just outside my line. And the reason I'm staying just outside my line is because I'm going to use my oscillating spindle sander to sand back to my line and smooth out the curve. And for all these parts, I'm only going to do this one time for now. This way I can get a nice smooth curve to transfer onto my remaining work pieces. 
And as long as I stay on the outside of the line for those work pieces, they should be able to be sanded back and match up with this one. And I'll show you an even better trick to getting all of those consistent here in a minute. So once I was satisfied with the overall curvature of each of my work pieces, I could then head back over to the bench and transfer those curves onto the remaining three pieces for each section. If there's one downside to projects like this, it's that you spend a lot of time repeating the same steps over and over. So when it comes to those types of scenarios, I do my best to just stay focused on what I'm doing and put on some good music or a good audiobook. But I'm kind of particular when I'm working in the shop about which one of those things I do. If I'm working on something super complicated, I like to listen to music I know, this way I don't have to think about it and it's more just background noise. But if I'm doing stuff that's a little more mindless, I guess is the best way to say it, I can introduce new things. I don't know, maybe that's just me. Let me know what your feelings are down in the comments. Do you find that that stuff distracts you or keeps you focused? If you find music and audiobooks a distraction, start your comment with distracted. If you find that it makes you more focused, start your comment with focused. And as always, if you start your comment with distracted or focused, I'll reply to you guys first because I know you're paying attention. All right, so with that sweeping curve marked out on my four legs, I could go ahead and trim it out over at the bandsaw. Now the goal here was to keep that three by three square at the top of the leg and then swoop down to that four inch width towards the base. I feel like this just grounds those outside pieces a little bit more and helps reinforce the theme of the curve. And the reason I didn't do this earlier is because I wanted that square reference face when I was plowing my mortises. With the curve in place, it'd be a lot more difficult to get those mortises aligned correctly. The only downside is that you have to put in all of the work to get to this point and then take all the risk when making the cut. So it was one of those moments where the songs I know were on repeat. So when it comes to sanding the curves, the first thing I want to do is hit everything with the oscillating spindle sander. Then from there, I'm going to clamp all my work pieces together and use my random orbit sander to sand them all as one block. This way, if there's any offset from one leg to the next, they will kind of level each other out and I'll get an overall smoother curve from all of my work pieces. Then from there, I'll just repeat the same steps for the rails. And while I finish that up, if you're finding this video enjoyable and entertaining, please like and subscribe. It really helps the video out and I greatly appreciate your support. Thanks. So to hold the lower sided shelf in place, I'm going to be using ledger strips. So the next thing I needed to do was set up my dado stack so that I can cut the grooves in the lower rails for those ledger strips. And the grooves here are going to be 3 eighths of an inch wide. This should give plenty of support for those lower shelves where we need it most, as the brunt of the weight of the Kamado is going to sit on these ledger strips as well as that center stretcher we talked about earlier. I'd say the main thing to pay attention to in this situation is that you don't mix up your top and bottom rails. And you also want to pick your outside facing grain orientation prior to making these cuts. Because obviously whatever side you cut your grooves in is going to face in towards the piece. So just make sure you plan ahead and label everything. From there I could go ahead and cut the rabbits into my actual ledger strips. Here I was just sure to check the fit as I worked and I wanted to err on the side of the strips being too tight because if they're too tight, I can just use my shoulder plane to clean them up, but if they're too loose, they're not gonna function properly and they're just gonna be a point of failure. So here, I just made sure that things were nice and snug. Next, I could use my crosscut sled to trim them down to their final length, which is gonna be just about a 16th of an inch shorter than the actual length of my groove. And that's so that there's a little wiggle room in there when it comes time to fit these into the joints. Here, we want them to be a little moron, which is much better than being a big moron. Next, it was finally time to glue and assemble the base. So what I did here was work in sections. First, applying a little glue to the mortise and then a little glue to the shoulder. Now, I don't want to oversaturate these joints, but I want to make sure that there's enough glue that they're going to hold well. Because the mortise and tenon joinery is so tight, there's not a whole lot of room for squeeze out. So when gluing the base together, I was very careful to use a minimal amount of glue. And after a couple hours and a few tense moments, the bases were assembled. The next day I could knock off the clamping blocks and use my random orbit sander to remove the CA glue. And I'm not connecting my two sides at the center just yet, this way it's a bit easier to move them around in the shop. Though I'd be lying if I didn't say space was getting pretty tight. Next I could apply a thin layer of epoxy to the bottom of all the feet to prevent ground moisture from being sucked up into the end grain. So I left the epoxy to cure overnight and then the next day came in the shop and started rough cutting down the eucalyptus for the slats. Now this is my first time working with eucalyptus, but it's very similar to working with cedar or cypress, though it doesn't smell quite as good as both of those. I do like that it has some warmer tones, which should accent some of the reds from the sapili. 
So once I had my tree slices cut down to their rough length, I could head over to the planer and skip plane the boards. Now with this lumber, it is S2S, so skip planing was an option. And since the joinery on this isn't as important as it was on the legs and rails, skip planing the boards wasn't a problem. Once I've got them thickness down to three quarters of an inch, I could head over to the joiner and joint one edge. Now for this project, I didn't buy a whole lot of extra lumber, so I don't have any extra material for any mistakes. And in fact, it was actually one board short, so I actually had to make a really small panel for one of my rear boards in order to have enough slats to finish the project. And I'm not pointing that out because I did something correct. In fact, it was probably wrong of me to do it that way. But what it did make me do was really think about every single cut for this project so that I didn't have any waste, since there was really nothing to fall back on. And I'll point out another example of where that almost came back to bite me in a couple of minutes. But I guess the moral of the story is, if you're unsure about your abilities in the shop or you question it at all, just buy an extra board. This way, if you make a mistake, you don't have to sweat it. So with all my slats ripped down to a 30 second over their final width so that I have plenty of room to hand plane back to my final width later on, I could practice a few of my ninja moves. And then from there, I could move on to trimming out my Sapili strips for my end caps. So the way I designed the top as well as the lower shelf is that there's always going to be some material end capping the end grain, whether that be the lower rails or the Sapili strip. The strip is also going to be dominoed to hold those slats in place for the upper tabletop, as well as a few of the cross sections for the lower shelf. And I apologize in advance if that doesn't make sense right now, but it will very shortly. All right, so the next step was to cut all my lower shelf slats to their final length. And I took that dimension directly off the workpiece, not off the plan, since we have the workpiece right in front of us at this point. As I've said countless times, it's much better to work off your actual workpiece than it is the plan, especially for internal parts like these. Next, it was time to notch the end slats. And these are the slats that are gonna butt up against that outside edge. We want them to wrap around those legs, so I just take those dimensions right off the leg. And then from there, I can head over to the bandsaw and trim out the notches. And since we're at the bandsaw, here's another bandsaw thought. Your fingers have fingertips, but your toes don't have toe tips. Yet, you can tiptoe, but not tip finger. So with my notches notched and everything fitting, I could go ahead and trim out the remaining slats. There is another slat that's going to need to be notched, and that's the final slat that runs front to back at the center. This one needs to be notched so that it wraps around the front post. So just like before, I'm gonna take my measurement directly off my leg. Then from there, it's back over to the bandsaw to notch it out. Now this notch is a little different in that it exists in the center of the board. So I'm first gonna make cuts on both of my ends where I need to make the cut, and then I'm gonna remove the material from the middle. The easiest way that I found to do this is just to angle the workpiece so that I can remove the bulk of the material. And then I'll just butt my fence up against my marking line so that I can trim everything flush. If I need to adjust the fit, I can always nudge the fence over a little bit and remove a little bit more material. Then from there, I can bring the workpiece back over to the project and test the fit. And it received the eyebrow raise of approval. Next, it was time to move on to the sleeper most difficult part of the project. When you see this piece, you probably assume that the base was the hardest part for me to do. However, you'd be mistaken, because building the center portion of the tabletop was by far the most challenging. And it wasn't challenging because it was difficult to make, it was more challenging because it was difficult to assemble and keep assembled. Before I dive into those details, I first needed to cut down one side of my angles. This way I could start with one side where all my angles were exactly 45 degrees. And once I had those angles in place, I went ahead and used some offcuts to separate all my slats by 3 8 of an inch. From there, I just used some blue tape to secure my end cap in place and marked out the positioning for my dominoes. Once I had all my marks laid out, I could just use my domino to plunge all the mortises. And at this point, things are pretty straightforward and it's not too complicated. But initially, I planned to cut all these strips at the table saw and then just plow the mortises and assemble everything. But after I made those initial cuts, I felt like it was better just to go ahead and use my track saw to make sure all my angles were even and aligned, which looking at it now was definitely the right call. So that right there was problem and solution number one. From there again, I could just go ahead and mark out all my dominoes, then plunge my mortises for my end cap. Again, at this point, everything is pretty straightforward, and to my knowledge, there's no real problem. The main thing I focused on when laying out the dominoes was that there's enough space between the edge of the board and the center of the dominoes so that I didn't run off the edge. 
And because my offcuts slash spacers were one inch wide, I just used those as a reference on the corner to make sure all my dominoes were gonna be within that tolerance. Now that I had the front of the top assembled, I just repeated those same steps for the rear side, which again came together swimmingly. The only big difference between the front and back is that we went from four slats down to three slats and the end cap that overhangs needed to be cut at a slightly different angle. This way I could attach the front end cap to the rear end cap using a domino. And that's what you see me marking out here. Now, as I said, building this structure wasn't all that complicated. What was really complicated and was kind of an oversight on my part was how I was going to clamp this together to keep everything square once it was time to assemble everything. And I was kind of fooled by that because when it came time to do the dry assembly, everything came together perfectly. So I wasn't really too concerned about it. But for whatever reason, when it came time to actually glue and clamp this piece together, it did not want to come together at all. And I think that just had to do with the fact that there was so many angles at so many different lengths that all needed to align perfectly for everything to come together, that it was just a little bit too much to ask for perfection. So what I took away from the experience was that I need to sometimes just slow down in the shop and not take things for granted. Even if it's something that can seem relatively simple, it's really worth putting in those practice runs to make sure things are going to come together correctly. Because it's definitely not worth all the added stress just to try to wing it. And like being a vegetarian, that was my mistake. So with all my slats trimmed out, I could go ahead and start hand planing the edges. Now, this is one of those processes that's both tedious and satisfying, which, as processes go, isn't the worst thing in the world. With all the edges planed down, I could head over to the router table to put a round over on all four edges of the slats. This process is one of those ones that unfortunately is tedious and not quite as satisfying but it does make all the roundovers consistent, which is really nice. I don't always like using roundover bits, and sometimes I prefer to hand sand or round things over manually, but again, for repetitive work like this, you can't beat a router table. Next, it was onto the glue up that almost broke me. So for the front side of the top panel, I just used some blocks glued on at 45 degrees to apply clamping pressure and squeeze everything nice and tight. Where the real problem started to show up was with the second panel, because I couldn't glue the whole panel together as one block like I did the first, and that's because I needed to allow some space in there for the end caps to fit together. So instead I worked one slat at a time, and once I had all three slats in place, I could glue and clamp the entire assembly together. And though in the edit it may not look challenging, take my word for it when I say it was a pain in the ass. After taking the rest of the evening to decompress, I came to the shop the next day and assembled my two wing pieces which thankfully were straightforward and came together quite easily. Next it was time for the final challenge of the top panel, and that was to cut the hole for the Kamado to fit through. This is the main part of the project that's just gonna vary from Kamado to Kamado. So for my grill, this hole needs to be 22 and a half inches in diameter, or an 11 and a quarter inch radius, which is probably more important. And to achieve that, I'm just going to make a quick trim alarm. I've done this same setup quite a few times in the past with great success. All you have to do is mark out your radius on a piece of scrap, drill two holes, one for your router bit and another for a screw to hold the trim alarm in place, and then pre-drill and attach that screw to the center of your circle. A little paste wax helps to keep things moving smoothly, and a backer board attached with some double stick tape keeps the router bit from blowing out the underside. It also stops your offcut from wandering and keeps your two pieces attached. From there you just take a few passes, dropping your router bit a little more and more each time until you're all the way through your workpiece. The main thing here is just to keep even downward pressure as you work your way around the workpiece. You really don't want the bit to start chattering. And if you do get some chatter, it might be a good idea to go ahead and pop in a couple of those spacers. But since I had an adequate amount of double stick tape, it wasn't really an issue. Also just be mindful of where your hose and power cord are so that they don't jerk the router off track. So with the circle cut, I could pop out the screw and then lift the entire assembly off of my backer board. I think it goes without saying that I was being quite gentle with the piece at this point so that I don't rip this thing apart. Although I guess I just said it, so it's with saying. Now, because I have a Kamado Joe, it has a spring assist assembly on the rear of the grill. 
So to notch that portion out, I'm just going to use a jigsaw and take my time to keep things as straight as I possibly can. From there, I could move on to laying out the curves for the ends of my wings. And again here, I'm just going to use a drawing bow and then take my work pieces over to the bandsaw to trim them out. Now you'll be left with some thin strips here, so you want to be kind of careful, otherwise you could easily lose a few fingers. And if you do, you'd be able to write with that hand, but you probably wouldn't be able to count on it. From there I could head over to the bench and just use my random orbit sander to smooth out the curve. Doing this also removes any of the saw marks that will inevitably be left by the bandsaw blade. Next it was time to head back over to the router table to finish rounding over any of the remaining parts. For any parts that I can't do at the router table, I'll just pop the bit into my trim router and finish rounding over those by hand. For the slats I was just careful not to round over the pointed parts, otherwise things might look kinda wonky. Next it was finally time to bring my two sides together. This was one of the glue ups I was kinda worried about, but luckily it went off without a hitch. And this one came together just like my other two base assemblies, only this time I invited my wife in the shop to assist me. And thankfully, she obliged. And you know things were a success when you end the entire endeavor with a high five. From there it was on to notching the upper rear rail. This again is going to be one of those things that's dependent on the type of Kamado you have. Since I have that spring assisted lift on the back of mine, I need to notch this out, but if you don't have it, then you don't really gotta worry about it. So what I'm first gonna do is mark out my upper and lower rail using a square. Then from there, I'm just gonna use my pole saw to notch out the top. And the reason I marked the top and bottom is so I can keep things aligned when I pop in the brace. And speaking of the braces, this again is one of those things where I told you I was running low on lumber and I ended up having to laminate two of my offcuts to get to my final thickness. Which for this part isn't the end of the world, but it would have been nice to do this in one solid piece. So once I marked the curve for the top and trimmed everything down to its final length, I could go ahead and use my drawing bow to mark out the decorative curve. Then from there I could trim them out at the bandsaw and pop them in place. Here I'm looking for a pretty snug fit, but not enough that it's going to actually lift the rail up off of the lower rail. I just want to make sure it's going to support everything structurally. Again, the lower rails are what are going to support most of the weight, so we don't have to worry too much about the top. From there I could go ahead and finish my lower slats. Now I'm going to cut these slats exactly like I did the other slats, where I used my table saw to trim everything down to its final length, and then the band saw to notch out the parts where needed. Now there's two sections on the lower portion that are really similar to the way the top came together. So for those sections I'm first going to cut them at 45 degrees, then domino in my end caps and attach everything. Luckily this section came together a whole lot easier than the top did though. Mainly because again I didn't have to focus on all the different angles matching up during the glue up. Instead for this section I could pop in one slat at a time and then just give it a little bit of force to hold everything in place. Yeah I swear that top assembly was about as difficult as being a vegan and keeping it to yourself. From there it was time to mark out and plunge all my pilot holes into my ledger strips. And I waited until now to do this just so I could make sure all my slats were in the correct position before plunging all my holes. Here I'm aiming to have two screws in the ends of each slat if possible. Though there are a few occasions where there will only be one in some of the slats just because of the way things taper. This was also really great timing because I just purchased and assembled this drill press during this project, so plunging the hundred or so holes was a good way to break it in. With all my pilot holes in place, the next step was to go ahead and glue in the ledger strips. So I'll just pop them in the grooves and use a few clamps to hold them in place. The fit on these is pretty snug, so three or so per section is all I need. And with everything in place, I could move on to the finish. And for the finish on this piece, I'm going to be using Osmo's UV Protection Oil. I've used this a few times on different projects on the channel, and I really love the way it's held up over time, so it's become my go-to for outdoor furniture. Just make sure you brush it on pretty sparingly, because a little bit goes a long way, and any excess will get kind of gummy if it sits on the surface. And once I had two coats of finish applied, I could go ahead and glue and screw in the slats. And while I finish that up, let me take a quick moment to say that if you guys are enjoying the videos on this channel and you want to support the show, I'd like to invite you to join my Patreon. It takes a lot of time to design, build, and shoot all these projects, as I do them all solo on nights and weekends. So having your guys' support really makes it worthwhile. There's a lot of fun behind the scenes stuff, as well as chats that are available for patrons, and other access that you just can't get through YouTube. So if that sounds like something that would interest you, check out the link in the description. And for all of you guys who've already joined, thank you so much for your continued support. Your donations go directly towards making these videos. 
And as always, if you can't join today, no sweat. Thank you guys for being a part of the community and watching these videos. All right, let's finish this behemoth up. So the next step was to go ahead and attach the top. Now to attach the top, I'm gonna be using figure eight fasteners. I've used these on a ton of indoor and outdoor projects and I've never seen any issues with rust or anything like that. So even though they're steel, this set works really well. And if you'd like to get yourself some, I'll leave a link down in the description. The other benefit of using figure eight fasteners is that I can adjust the tops as needed. So if the grill needs to sit a little further back or a little further forward, I'm able to move the top in the direction that it needs to go. Now another benefit of attaching the top this way is that you don't have to drop the grill into the hole. Instead, you can slide the top over top of the grill, though it does require you to take the grill apart a bit. The good thing is doing so makes the grill a lot lighter to work with, so it's kind of a win-win. With the Kamado reassembled and the center panel centered nicely, I could use a few more spacers along with clamps to make sure that my wings were aligned. Then from there, I could pre-drill and drive in a couple screws to hold the tops in place. From there, we're ready to start cooking and for those glamour shots. This grill station was a challenge from start to finish. Even designing this project took me a lot longer than most do, just because it was so many aspects to deal with. From the weight of the grill, to the multitude of complex mortise and tenon joinery, all the way down to how the slats would ultimately support themselves. And of course, we can't forget the top, which will probably haunt my dreams for weeks to come. But luckily in the end, everything came together exactly as planned. And I really did have an absolute blast building it. Plus, as an added surprise bonus, my wife and I were able to add onto our patio using some pavers, which really doubled down on the space savings. But that's a whole nother venture. At the end of the day, this is a piece that's going to probably see more abuse than most other pieces I build. And that's because the elements, the grill, and just using it over time, it's going to take a beating. So this is the most perfect this piece will ever look. And if something truly horrible does happen to it, I know a guy that can probably fix it. Either way, I can't wait to fire this bad boy up and start creating some memories with my friends and family. So if you enjoyed this project and you want to see more like it, check out this video over here next. Subscribe so you don't miss the next one. And as always, I knew this would work and I'll see you next time.